Game of Thrones Season 2, Episode 6, The Old Gods and the New Gods, directed by Ava DuVernay. What are you doing? The, the New Gods, directed by Ava DuVernay. I, I, yeah, I guess so. Dark but... Side, Orion? No, yeah, whatever, Apocalypse. Man. Not your best opening. New Genesis? Man, yeah. It's a play on word. It's an arbitrary combination of two nerd references. Nerds love that. Whatever. Have you seen the t-shirts? I'm just saying, it's not working for me. No, yeah. All right, then get out. I got a replacement monkey. George! Damn, you're... Two Rampage references in a (laughs) row. (laughs) That's that's too, too many. (laughs) Yeah. So this episode opens up with basically the, the siege of Winterfell. Not really a siege because Theon just straight up takes it. But I love how Mace Lewin is just hurrying to the Raven Room to send the messages off because he's loyal to the Starks. So he wants to get word to Rob of what's happening. And it's a very tense opening scene. Yeah, it is. And I love when Theon goes into Winterfell's, uh, goes into Bran's room and Bran wakes up. He's like, what the fuck are you doing here, Theon? Because he's like the last thing he can like conjure in his mind is that Theon took Winterfell because <laughs> it's, it's fucking Theon did we win so he's like what the is the war over he's like Theon, what's your bitch ass doing in here <laughs> oh Theon what's up man and the way and the way he says like I'm a Greyjoy <laughs> the way he says that too. can't fight for Rob and my father I'm, I'm a, a Greyjoy, Greyjoy. <laughs> like buckles up <laughs> like shut up and it's like, it's like get the fuck out of here and he's very defiant he says I'll never yield the castle to you we'll fight and throw you out and Theon's like well I'll just murder everybody <laughs> Brad's yeah. like, when you put it that way. <laughs> and I could, like, wait, Bran asks the like, if he hated us this whole time, and he kind of just walks out, doesn't respond. Right, and the theme of Theon in this episode, and over the past couple of episodes, too, is just the conflict written all over him. That you could tell that he's not 100% sure of what he's doing. Um, and we talked about this before, that the taking of Winterfell is probably the greatest achievement that a Greyjoy has ever done. <laughs> and then in a couple of episodes, when Yara comes to Winterfell with her men, nobody fucking told you to do this. Why would you do this? What, are you stupid? Well, it probably is the best Greyjoy accomplishment until Euron won the uh, the King Smoot by just talking about his dick the whole time. Yeah, right. Okay. That, that's a pretty good accomplishment, too. I mean... Yeah, and then that inner conflict, like, he kind of has to get pushed to take Roderick's head. Like, he's basically, he's running the show pretty much. It's like, nah, you gotta take Roderick is furious, too, because they did consider him almost like a son, a son of Winterfell. They all did. I mean, Lewin tries to convince him not to, but he's just so lost at this point. That line that Roderick says to Bran when Bran's screaming, you know, don't do it, and Roderick's like, quiet now, child, I'm off to see your father. Yeah, give me chills. I'm like, that's a good good fucking thing. That's a sad. And Bran still keeps crying. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's very sad. I mean, no, it's one of the saddest deaths of the show. And it's he's not even like we like Roderick. I mean, we read the books and we like those supporting characters that really are kind of bring, not they a, bring life to not the at show. the forefront. But you can just see the regard Bran has for him and to the star, what he meant to the Starks growing up. They pretty much raise him. He's the master at arms, you know. Yeah. So he's like an uncle to Bran almost. Um, and he says to Theon, "I should have put a sword in your belly instead of your hand." So. He has that same rapport with Theon, and he says, Ned Stark raised you like a son, and Theon snaps back. He raised me with his sons, not as one of his sons. So you could tell that Theon is still harboring some resentment towards Ned, because even though later he says that Ned was his real father, I guess he never... He was He's almost like Jon Snow, except he takes it in a completely different way. And when he's going to sentence Roderick to death and kill him, Roderick says, the man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. And just that moment, the way that Theon can't get his head off with a clean stroke, it's just that conflict. He's trying to force something that isn't there. He's not 100% behind this. And Alfie Allen is just an incredible actor. The conflict on his face, body movements, his voice, you could tell that he's just a man riddled with internal conflict. Yeah, Roderick probably should have kept his mouth shut if one of the other guys did it. Nice, clean, you're dead, you know. Yeah. See you later. Theon, he kind of, he was alive after the first was like, yeah. Fuck! <laughs> and even his first mate can't even cleft you all. It's like, oh, God, Leon, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great when the rain starts coming down. And it's it's similar to when Rob beheads Karstark. Yeah, but Theon is lost in this scene, whereas Rob was more confident in what he was doing. Yeah, well, Roderick has a line, Theon Greyjoy, you truly are lost. Then we go to John and a Half Hand, which is a great title for a buddy sitcom. So <laughs> It really would be. <laughs> and these two actors... Uh, I love this guy who plays Corrin Halfhand. It's funny because I just looked up his name and I don't remember it. <laughs> you, oh, the actor? Yeah. You're bad at that. He's not in a lot of stuff, but he's really good as this character. 
And he's kind of talking to John about like, you know, no one cares who's up here protecting them. No one's going to know what you do. And then he goes, you got me? And he's like, yeah. He's like, you don't know anything. <laughs> he's he's like, like, he, basically, he basically hit him with a you know nothing, Jon Snow. Yeah, yeah. He was the first one to do it. And it's almost like the way Tyrion was torturing Lancel in the last episode where he's just fucking with him. It's like, they'll never know who sacrificed their life, but they'll be alive because of you. Do you get me, boy? Yeah, I got you. I'm just fucking playing, man. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure that you don't have a fucking panic attack. And do you think they were hinting at John being a warg in this episode when w- Ghost is kind of just on his own? And yeah, Corrin's like, you can't train a wild thing. You can't tame a wild animal. And John's like, Ghost is different. Yeah. Because they have that connection. And John doesn't know what he's doing, but he kind of he still has that connection with him. Little as you know, Ghost's like, yeah, I need to go save Sam's ass in like a couple episodes, so I need to get out of here. Yeah, well, I'm out of here. They're separated for a long time, huh? Yeah, they are. He doesn't see him back until he... Uh... Season four, right? I think it's four when he takes back the keep. Yeah. Yeah, that's season four. Okay, yeah. Uh, next scene, it's Tyrion. I mean, Tywin hosting another war council. And once again, it's one of those scenes between him and Arya. But they don't really have a conversation. Tywin is chastising one of his generals for sending the wrong letter to the wrong house. He sends the letter to House Dormant about the troop movements. And it's a house that's loyal to House Stark. So they're they're having a tough time, man. He said it in the previous episode that you know, Rob has a great mind for warfare. And if there's one character that can match Tywin in terms of military intelligence, it's Rob. So they're they're in a disarray here. Yeah, and Tywin's, again, impressed at Arya that she's able to read. I feel like what I said last episode, I feel like she kind of likes Tywin <laughs> in this scene. It gets a different perspective, you know, because obviously he's, he's the enemy to to the Starks, but you take all that out of that, and you, she kind of, I guess she kind of respects, like, the way he commands respect and the way he chastises his underlings for doing something wrong and how he's... It's pretty much a perfectionist, and it's, I kind of I really like the scene watching it again because I, I don't know if this slipped by, but like we hear Littlefinger allude to the chaos offering opportunity, which is kind of a precursor to his big uh, monologue. I love how Tywin's like, "Wow, you speak like you're the first person to ever think of that." <laughs> Just tell me what you have to fucking say. <laughs> Stop with the fucking riddles. Get to the point. But he does like what Littlefinger has to say, where he's saying, "Hey, let's team up with House Tyrell." They want revenge on Stannis. They're the second richest house behind yours. Tywin has that line, more wine for Lord Baelish. I'm pretty sure Littlefinger knows that's Arya. But for his plans, it wouldn't make sense for him to rat her out. Because that puts you one step closer to the war ending, if the Lannisters have Arya. Uh, I'm not sure. He's, he's seen her all the time in season one. He wasn't really paying attention. He was more locked in on Sansa. Yeah, but do you think Littlefinger doesn't remember what Arya looks like? He sat next to her during a tournament. She looks different. Why do they call you Littlefinger? She looks exactly the same. You gotta if you didn't up. know Arya, you would have a hard time telling boy or girl, but he knows Arya. You're the one who sucks off Littlefinger. You're always slurping him for his intelligence. You think that's getting by him? She's not really paying attention. He's sitting in a room with Tywin Lannister. He's staring know? at her. No, the whole... very va- she's turning. Dude, she's, she's she's, he stares at her for like three seconds. He's like... I don't know. You don't think he, he would be like, oh, by the way, Tywin. Tywin will hook him up for that. Like, oh, shit, Littlefinger. Was he going to give him Harren? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, they're there. Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure Littlefinger didn't know. You don't catch these things like I do. I you did need, catch you, the way he was looking at they, You need to pay it's more It's impossible attention. not to catch it. They focus on Littlefinger trying to look, and that builds suspense in the scene. It's like, oh, oh my God, does he recognize her or not? Obviously, you catch it, but I, I, yeah. Fuck you. Stupid. I don't have to take this. Yeah, Ted, uh, yeah, I'm going to need somebody to uh, record with me. He left the studio. Yeah, he took an Uber. Good luck. And we have an introduction in this episode to one of the most important characters of the show, and especially for Jon Snow's arc. It's the introduction to Egret. When Corrin Halfhand and Jon Snow and their men, they raid a, a wildling lookout, and Jon meets Egret for the first time. And this reminds me of in Breaking Bad in Season 5, when Jesse didn't want to kill Lydia. It's that sexism that Mike would always say, hey, she's a woman, she deserves to die just as much as any man. But Jon can't bring himself to kill Egret because she's a pretty girl. It, it's funny, you know? It's that subtle sexism where it's not, I guess it's a good thing for Egret. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, back back then, I mean, in Westeros, in this world, that's not an honorable thing to do. And Yeah, it shocks him. Yeah. Well, why, is, why is she running with the boys? <laughs> and She gets it in like that? John obviously can't do it and lets Eager, Eager get away. And it's, why is Corrin saying, oh, we'll meet you at the top of the mountain? I don't know. I was just thinking, too. Like, it would probably it's be, just so convenient. Their whole plan was like to sneak in and kill Manstrader. New plan. Just use that to their advantage. Like, all right, John, don't kill her. Like, act like you're freeing her and go with her. And and then you kill Mance Raider. Yeah. Yeah, sacrifice John. Yeah, that would be the smarter thing to do. I don't know I don't know why they didn't do that. Oh, maybe because John's actually a Targaryen and he's like a main character. 
Oh, right. Yeah. Now it makes okay. sense. Yeah. Aegon. Get it right. Oh, God. So then Aegon and Egret. Have I mentioned if you call him Aegon, I won't talk to you? Oh, or- uh, you went on a whole rant on Stranger Things 2 review. Oh, yeah. So go look up that. <laughs> If you guys want to see that, I stand by it. This would be a little like rant that means nothing, and it's probably stupid. I Jane. So we'll cut it's this. Fu- out. It's fucking eleven. I don't want to hear oh, Jane. Oh god. That's like when you say if someone calls Jon Snow Aegon. There you go, Ted. It's a Game of Thrones reference. When uh, someone calls Jon Snow Aegon from now on, I, I fucking That's hate so that different. person. That's so different. It's eleven. It's not Jane. No, I think you can go with both. It's more eleven than Jane, but the Aegon thing. I would. I'd rather it be Jane. It's her fucking real name. It's eleven. What's wrong with that? John's real name is Aegon, but I'm calling him John Snow. So that's your. That's, that's what a, you want to do. Yeah, but that's I a know dumb, how stupid it sounds. And that's it's a just, dumb name. Yeah, true. I was. Yeah, and basically, Egret gets away, and then John has to track her down. And did they really get that far away that John can't reunite with his man? That's what I thought too. But you know, it's getting cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Got to snuggle up. This relationship is great, John and Egret. I always said, even though Daenerys and John going back and rewatching season seven, it's it's grown on me. This relationship, I think, is the best out of any two characters in the show in terms of romance. It's more because, like, John and Daenerys are kind of like, what do they really bond over? Or, like, what do they... I guess they have the same mindset, but this is more like the opposites attract type deal. It's funny. It's fun, it's fun to watch. It feels like it's more natural. And then we see Marcella getting shipped off to Dorne and Cersei just... I feel, come on. Like, I, I'm a big Cersei guy. I think that's well known, but lay off my man Tyrion a little. Oh, it's it's awful. This whole <laughs> season. <laughs> Just absolutely no logic in any of her thinking when it comes to Tyrion, and it, it's just so annoying. And it's hard for Tyrion, too, because like he said, he, he said Marcella's a sweet little girl in the last episode. I don't blame her at all for you. It's hard for Tyrion to see Marcella going away as well. He kind of just walks away. He's like, I can never catch a break around but these people. This leads up to one of the most intense scenes of any season, the riot. And you can see that it begins with all the peasants shouting out, Oh, hell, King Joffrey, seven blessings, my king. And then somebody throws something, and then it's just all hell breaks loose. And you can see Joffrey, he goes from find him to kill them all. <laughs> yeah, he's he's not very rational. But yeah, this is a very intense scene. I mean, all these things from like Sansa getting trapped by the peasants. Oh, yeah. And such a great one, that, when the hound saved her. Such a great moment. Yeah, because that's a really dark moment, man. Like, this innocent girl is about to... It is a, it's a very dark scene because it kind of goes on a little bit longer than you think. Right. Because you kind of get the idea of what's going to happen. Like, she gets caught by the peasants and you can just have the hound come in at that moment. But they kind of drag it out a little and builds a little bit of suspense until the hound... Yeah, he got there right in time. Because you're like, holy shit, like, this, is, this is fucked up. And then the hound comes and what a shot. Just ripping out this guy's entire guts. Yeah. He leaves one guy, though, in the back corner. He leaves one survivor. I guess it's like one of those tell your friends what happened here type things, but he kind of like freezes up. He's like, if I don't move, maybe he won't see me. Yeah, it's like a dinosaur. <laughs> it's like a T-Rex. And the Hound has a great line to Joffrey, too, when Joffrey's like, I, I want them all dead. And he's like, they want the same for you. Even, too, it's great. Another great Tyrion moment when he's just belittling Joffrey in front of everyone. Oh, like, at yeah. this moment, he doesn't give a fuck. He slaps him again. And then it's like, we've had vicious kings and idiot kings, but I'm not sure we've ever been blessed with a vicious idiot. Stop You're it. talking to a king! Ah! And now I've struck a king. Did my hand fall from my wrist? Where is the and Joffrey just walks away when Tyrion brings up the idea. He's like, hey, we need to find Sansa. Yeah, because like, if we Sansa need her, dies, yeah. it's, it's over for Jaime. And also, he probably doesn't want to see Sansa fucking die anyway. No. You know? I like uh, when he tries to like congratulate the Hound oh, on a yeah. job well done. Yeah, once again, hinting at that relationship between the Hound and Sansa, that the Hound does care for her, that he feels bad for her, that she's in this situation. Uh, it, it's just so funny how, when you see the respect that Tywin commands from his underlings, and then you compare that to Tyrion, that there's just certain people that will never respect him when he tries to tell Marin Trant to find Sansa and he's like I take my orders from the king that's, yeah, the, king's, that, that's the king's fucking hand you take orders from him too that's Tywin he's like yes sir right away sir right yeah yeah it just shows that no matter what Tyrion does there's just some people that will just never respect him but this is a horrifying scene you see the man get his arm ripped off it's so interesting too because this moment especially in the books causes so many different things to happen you could see where it kind of allows the, uh, the high sparrow to kind of have right. that have that thing to slip in. I mean, Lawless gets raped, and that ends up becoming Bronn's stepchild, right? Tyrion. <laughs> yeah. That's just an awesome name, by the way. That's awesome. And I talked about last episode that Daenerys. Well, two episodes ago, we talked about how Daenerys is not the best diplomat. She's not the best schmoozer. We see her talking to the Spice King. She just doesn't know how to deal with these type of situations where she's trying to get this man to give her him his ships. She just completely loses control. And once again, she's like, she's like adorable in this scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Spice King. That's a pretty dope name too. I don't. I don't know if people call me the Spice King, but yeah, when people that is like, a dope name. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, 
He's great too. I don't know why, but I just like him. But it's another. <laughs> I love the way. I mean, he he's talks. using logic in his situation. Obviously, rooting for Daenerys and want her to succeed. But his logic isn't flawed, really. That's when we were saying last episode how people can hate on Daenerys. You could see how she comes off as spoiled and entitled. Like, this really makes no sense for him to give you the ships, and you're just going to carry on because you're not getting what you want. I do like the way that she hinted at her dreams about hatching the dragons, that she had the three petrified dragon eggs, and she basically became the mother of dragons because she birthed them through whatever magic she has. And you would think upon hearing that story, dragons haven't been around for centuries that somebody would take a gamble. You know, give her five ships. Give her ten ships. I wish my dreams came true. That's that's really depressing. <laughs> well, I mean, like we said with the Spice King, like, all right, we, there hasn't been dragons in the years. <laughs> it is a fresh-ass name, you know? <laughs> It is, right? Yeah. It's like, all right, we haven't seen dragons in years. But the way she presents it, like, my dreams come true. Like, all right, I'm not, I'm not, not going to take that for anything, you know? And this is one of the first conversations between Arya and Tywin where you've been saying that Arya almost has a respect for Tywin, possibly even likes him. And Tywin asks Arya about how she learned to read, who her father was. And Arya says, my father's dead. And Tywin asks her, what killed your father? And she says, loyalty. Tywin's like, you're a sharp little thing, aren't you? Uh, And then we learn a little bit of history into Tywin and really what happened with his father, the reigns of Castamere. That really said it, Tywin was who he is, because he felt like his father was just so weak, and he really had to just be like, all right. His father sucked. Yeah. He was awful. That's why he's such an, to an extreme. Like, Tywin, you can respect a lot of stuff that he does and see what he brings to the table. It's like, all right, this guy, you know. But he, he he's willing to go to the extreme to secure that his family is going to be in the best possible place, and so is he going to be. So And he's going to be in the best possible place as well. He has no problem sending the mountain and doing his dirty work. He has, you know, no problem just destroying your house because <laughs> you start talking shit. Yeah, he's, it's all about his family. That he's willing to go to any length to protect what is his, to protect his name. And then we see Arya steal the letter. Did you catch what was on this letter? Yeah, it was uh, about troop movements, right? That troops were going to the Golden Tooth. Yeah. That's what I recall. It's one of the strongest castles in the Westerlands. Basically, Rob has the Lannisters on the run at this point. Uh, it's their source of wealth, too. It's. I you think, think this letter's like a game changer? You think she does? I mean, she's probably just grabbing anything. I mean, she's probably look around maybe there's something else you can grab yeah it's a risk that i don't think really would have paid off because they probably send multiple letters anyway there's not only one raven going out so could have been a fake yeah, decoy could've. letter but this is when Arya has to use her second kill when armory lock finds Arya stealing the letter and jack and i love when she's like you have to do it now he's like a man a girl cannot tell a man when the thing has to be done <laughs> She's like, listen, bitch, yeah. <laughs> it has to be done now. Uh, and it's, 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 once again, you're seeing the power of the Faceless Men, how just in a, in a split second he can be able to kill somebody that's almost untouchable. Yeah, and it's, you know, we talked about it last episode, like the way she uses her three kills. As well, in, in the moment, yeah, she had you can no see choice. why she can use she Because she would have been dead. Or even worse. What's worse? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> super, de- super, dead. super dead but uh, if she does get caught she'd be like hey I'm Arya Stark so you can't kill me yeah, it probably would have been better if she read the books <laughs> and in this next scene it's Rob once again talking to Talissa and he finds out her name I love this relationship because the two have great chemistry and I think Talissa is a really good character and it's it's Rob falling in love it's him falling into the trap and once he sees his mom he's like oh hey this is Talissa she's been helping with the wounded she's been very helpful yeah <laughs> <laughs> but going back to like just him walking, looking so kingly, and we were, oh, I, I, I referred that. to Renly like before, like how he, you could tell he's a good king, just the way he interacts with like his people. He generally cares, and you know, Rob's walking around, he's like, hey, how you doing? Oh, let me look at your helmet. You know, he doesn't give a, <laughs> he doesn't give a fuck probably, but you know, it's nice to see he's interacting with his people, and it's what he's learned from his father. Yeah, you know, the way to be a leader, to sit with your lords when you have them over for feasts, you know, to interact with those individuals, it just boosts morale. Yeah. So it's very smart and very similar to Renly. Uh, but it's him falling in this trap, man. Catelyn tries to tell him, hey, you're promised to another. You can't follow your heart. Rob's like, I know. He's like a little kid in this That's scene. why I kind of like... I know, mommy. I guess she's more of an interesting character than Jane Westerling, but... A hundred times more interesting. Jane Westerling is all... All she does is, like, whine. Rob doesn't spend time with me. Yeah. Oh, no, Rob's dead. <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, it's kind of like, you know, it's Rob chasing love rather than being sucked in by his honor in order to marry this girl. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going somewhere else. No, I thought I could phrase it a little better. 
Suck is just such a funny word. Suck. You know, sucks for Bruce Bolton. But he informs them that the news of Winterfell. And then... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rob is furious in this scene. Yeah, he's pissed. He's really like, it's like, how could how could he do this? Like, you know, Ruth says he's like, uh, my bastard son will be, uh, what does he say? Oh, he'll be proud proud to bring back Theon's head to Rob. Uh, understatement of the goddamn century. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, what is your bastard like? Can I get some characteristics? Oh no, no, he's he's a good guy. He's good people. He's good people. Yeah. He'll get the job done. And that he does. But I like that line where Rob says he needs to march back north. If I can't hold my castle, how can I call myself king? And Roose is like, you are a king. That means you don't have to ha- do everything yourself. Yeah, and send my sick freaking bastard to do it for The you. one time Rob listens to Roose Bolton's advice, and it's the worst the worst piece of advice to listen to. <laughs> Probably just so it happens. Like, oh, now I gotta fucking kill Rob. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> Yeah, and speaking of Theon, we see him shacking up at uh, Osha, and she's kind of trying to seduce him. Theon's very weak-minded, and he's always been prone to choosing his... Well, his biggest weakness is his manhood. Yeah. yeah. So Ramsay almost did him a favor. He cut off his biggest weakness. You know what? He said, we're going to get rid of this. You're going to start thinking with your head. (laughs) Oh, wait, you're an idiot. (laughs) Uh, But it's a great move by Osha. Even before, when uh, Theon takes Winterfell, Bran kind of looks at her and is like, how can you do this or whatever, when she like kind of kneels before Theon. Right. You know. And I think even at that point, she's thinking, let me get in his good graces so yeah. I can try and help the Stark kids. So, and then she does do that. She sneaks away and she brings Bran and Rick on with them. She, oh, ga- she that, gathers the crew. That pose when she nice that one guy. Woo! It's a sexy ass pose. She's like, come here, boy. Come yeah, here. This, can you, look, you can't look at Tonks the same anymore, right? When you watch Harry Potter. Oh, hell yeah, I can look at her the same. What did they say in uh, the, a couple episodes ago that the best beauty is concealed beauty? So I guess it kind of ruins it that way. But hell yeah, I can look at Tonks the same. Don't call me Nymphadora. Mm. <laughs> See you, girl. Uh, and before the last scene of the episode, um, we go back to King's Landing. And this is a great scene, too, because Sansa is almost confining in Shay. She thinks of Shay as the one friend that she has in King's Landing, the one person that she can actually talk to. And she's willing to say, I hate the king in front of Shay. And Shay's even like, don't say things like that. You know, don't trust anybody. Because I think even Shay is thinking, I like this girl, but I'm not, I, I, I'd be willing to betray her if it's my life. Because we see Shay do that in later seasons. She betrays somebody that she quote-unquote loves, and it's good advice to Sansa. Yeah, and Sansa still can't really understand the way the real wor- world works. She's talking to her about, like, uh, I never met these people before. Why do they hate me? It's like, you don't ha- they don't have to know you to hate you. I mean, it's just the perception of the crown and the royalty and my life sucks you're the, you're supposed to marry the king like it's your fault we don't like you for it and the final scene of the episode is zoro's on doxos i don't like this character <laughs> he's just annoying nice no, thanks i am the richest man in koth i had nothing <laughs> how many times does he say that in season two well because he really doesn't have anything so the more he has to say it, he has to believe himself oh yeah yeah so he's, he's gotta just keep reinforcing that idea and Daenerys is telling him about all the different offers. You know, one guy offered me ten ships, but I had to sleep with him. Another, I forget the other offer. I think it was only one ship. That's kind of disrespectful. Oh, one ship and <laughs> one night. <laughs> Daenerys is in a tough spot, and then when she gets back to Zora Zondox's, um compound, and her dragons have been kidnapped by Piat Pri, taken to the House of the Undying. And it's a great final scene where you hear the cries of the dragons. They sound like human cries, almost. It was actually a cut scene, right? Where were you in the whole cut scene? What do you mean a cut scene? Well, because I think Dora, they show her killing Eerie in uh, a scene that was cut, deleted scene. Oh, right, right, right. Like, are they canon? Yeah. It's almost like Legends. Like, unless they confirm that that actually happened, I'll take it as canon. Like, the Tywin and Tywin and Pycelle scene. Because I can assume that that actually happened. That's That seems like something that would be real. But, yeah, you know, it's a, it's pacing issues. You don't you didn't need to see What's-Her-Face killing Eerie. Doria kill Eerie. I liked Eerie. She got... Oh, I loved Eerie, yeah. She got screwed. Very loyal. Yeah. What killed Eerie? Loyalty. It's a callback. I uh, know, we get it. House of the Undying, though, but that's that's going to be very important moving forward. Uh, yeah. This is what brings season two together for me, because it's not a Daenerys season, but this is so important to her arc. Specific, more so in the books, but I think it's it's handled well in the show, too. And it, it's, it's very interesting. Well, it's all leading up to the House of the Undying stuff. But that's really the only payoff we get in this season with Daenerys, whereas Tyrion gets so many great fucking moments. Even John's kind of yeah. pushed us pushed us to the side a little. I mean, what he's doing is important, and it, you know, looking back at it, it's like, oh, remember when John like that's when he finally met Egret and all this other stuff. But in in real time, and while season two was happening, it's kind of like, yeah, it's War of the Five Kings stuff more so than 
the stuff that's become very Rob's important. Rob's more of a focus than Daenerys and Tyrion. Well, that's why his death is so impactful, too, because Rob is being positioned as our hero. Uh, what would you give this episode out of 10? I don't want to say, I'm not going to say it's a low point, but it's probably one of the lesser episodes of season two. It was seven point seven and a half. Yeah, I go seven and a half as well. I agree with you. I think I'm getting harder on the ratings as the season. <laughs> yeah, you become the Skip Bayless of movie reviews. You know what it is, though? But if you keep giving everything an eight, you know, I got to try to differ- differentiate it. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I butchered that word. But you guys know what I meant. So. If you're the Skip Bayless on the Shannon Sharp. Skip. <laughs> Hey guys, thank you for watching this video, and before we go, I want to quickly thank our Patreon supporters. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to grow and evolve as a channel, so thank you for your generous pledges. If you are interested in supporting our channel through Patreon, visit www.patreon.com nerdsoup, and you can see the different rewards we offer to our Patreon supporters. T-shirts, mugs, stickers, access to our behind-the-scenes video, and more. Thanks again for watching this video, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Or dislike, don't share, and unsubscribe. It's a binary world, folks.